Hey, Melissa. Hey, Jamie. How's it going? Good. I'm in LA with you. I know. And it's like, it's kind of funny for me to even ask you, how's it going? Because I kind of already know how it's going because you've been at my house for two days. (laughs) Which felt like my house. So uh, going to your house and being in your kitchen intuitively open up the trash where I would have the trash. Right. I open up the the cabinet immediately where I would keep the cups and you have the cups there. Yeah. You know how you go to somebody's house yeah. and they have everything in the wrong place? <laughs> oh, and there is a wrong place. I mean, we all know that like when you set up your house, I mean, men don't know this, but women know like the forks go somewhere. The junk drawer goes another place. Like it's all, there's a, there's a specific place where it should all go. There's a work triangle. Oh my God. So smart. And I love that you said that because you're right. It's like the sink, the range and the fridge have to form like the triangle, the work triangle. The only thing that I get confused is should the dishwasher be on the right side of the sink or the left side? Oh, honey, the the left, but I'm right-handed. And so like, I'm a right-handed person who like, if I were to ride a skateboard, which I don't know how, um, I would put my right foot on it and push with my left. If, if I'm right-handed, which I am, it feels weird to me to turn to my right to put dishes. I would rather turn to my left. I don't know why. But what about you? So my dishwasher is on the left. You might but, too. Um, I did a remodel on my house. It's yeah. a 1975 A-frame. And the kitchen was 70s. Um, I had to use all the same plumbing I couldn't move it around because it was what it was. Like it would have cost a lot so of money. Like move the sink. No. Or anything. So I had to work with the the footprint of the kitchen. Yeah. And so weird that we have the same things. You have the same range that I have. Yeah. Uh, your fridge is very like how you have your fridge organized. The handles mm-hmm. that we talked about uh, are the same. The countertops. Like I don't know. We just have a lot of the same taste. So I'm glad you feel comfortable. We love having you at my house and. Um, I hope that you absolutely love that my 100 pound German shepherd uh, wants to sleep with you every night. <laughs> he literally forces his way into your bedroom and you're like, uh, shadow, scoot, scoot. Like, dude. Well, it's appropriate name shadow because he follows. He's your shadow. Yeah. He's, he's my shadow. Yeah. He stalks you. But yeah, my dogs are really excited that you're there. They're actually trying to abandon me to go to you, which is making me a little bit jealous, but I know it'll all just be temporary. <laughs> Well, your dog tried to French kiss me. Yeah, you can have your dog back. <laughs> he 100% literally jumped on your head and tried to French kiss you, which was amazing. Um, but I love having you at my house. We're getting a lot done. You just told me the great news that you're actually coming back next week. So we're going to get even more done. I love having you here in LA. But we came to the studio today to tackle a very complex and long standing serial murder case that is all over the news. And although Lipstick and Lies, as the name implies, is a female-centric show, it is. it covers cases that cater to our fascination with female perpetrators, whether it's, you know, female killers, con artists, you know, all of the above. But what's unique that I think the listeners are going to find out toward the end of this episode um, is that, Melissa, you have a unique connection to the Gilgo Beach murders case uh, that came about fairly recently. And I really want to talk about that. And it's for very good reason, but you've got some insight that nobody else has. And given your background, which I know you've talked about at nauseum, but um, given your background, you already had somewhat of a connection to the case in that sense. But now you have a true connection because We'll talk about that toward the end of well, the episode. But July 13th was on Friday, July 13th, my phone was blowing up. It was the arrest of Rex Huberman, and he is the alleged Long Island serial killer. And it was revealed that he had a wife and two adult children. So my phone was just going crazy. People were texting me saying, Have you heard the news? They caught the alleged Long Island serial killer, and he has a family. Um, And to me, it instantly brought back memories of 1995 when my father was arrested and the detectives came to our home and interrogated my mother and myself. um, I mean, interrogated my mother. And it it was just a refresher of almost, you know, 
well, how many years ago was that? A lifetime ago. Um, it just brought it all back. And then I thought, um, well, then I started seeing the tabloids and the press and the media swarming this poor family. And you see the images of Asa, the estranged wife of uh, Rex, just downbeaten. And I felt like I was a voyeur to watching the media kick a woman while she's down. Yeah. A and and for those of you who may not know, the Melissa talks about her father's arrest back in 1995. Um, he had, unbeknownst to you and your family, he had been living a double life and was, in fact, a serial killer and was finally arrested in 1995. It absolutely blew your world up. It yeah, came it was as 16. a complete shock. 16 years old. Um, I absolutely had no idea about his double life. I mean, I'll be able to, you know, over time, I'll tell you some some stories that are, you know, the red flags that I missed. But um, right now, what, what I want to speak about and what I'm so glad that we have this forum, it gives, I feel really empowered right now mm -hmm. to have a voice, to have a platform, to have a voice. Um, but going back to watching the news unfold of Asa and the adult children, Victoria and Christopher, it just brought it all back to me. And it also reminded me why I'm so vocal. And I want the, I wanted the family to know that they're not alone because I felt so alone as a teenager thinking I'm the only person in the entire world that is going through this or has ever gone through this. And that, adds to the trauma and the pain. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to be, I wanted to be helpful. So, um, one of the things that over the next couple of days, so after July 13th, the news broke, then you're seeing this dilapidated house and this, this woman, you know, just totally looked frayed and broken from the devastation sitting on the porch. They then uh, go into the home for, I think, 12 or 14 days. It's a long period. It was a long um, time that the feds were there and the authorities were there to collect evidence out of the home. And they were displaced. The family was displaced. And during that time period, I had a private conversation with my husband, uh, Steve, who you are married to a Steve, yeah, by the way. Married. So we're both married to Steve. So <laughs> I'm going to call. Does my husband get the honor of Steve one? Who's yeah. older? <laughs> well, I'm older than you, but that doesn't mean my husband's. My husband was born in April 1978. Okay. Mine was born in 1978 as well. So it went what month? June. Oh, mine's older. Okay. So Steve's two, I guess. Two it's Steve two. Older. All right. My husband, Steve two. I had Shit, a I'm sorry, Steve two. We still love you too. Wait, they say first the worst, second the best. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll take it. Um, so Steve number two, not. <laughs> he, wait. That sounds like. That <laughs> Steve likes to take number twos. Wait, that's my husband. <laughs> okay. Steve, my husband. There you Melissa's go. That's all you have to husband, say. husband. We, we had a private conversation and I said to my husband, I want to do something, yeah. but you know, if I come forward, it's going to bring everything up. If I start speaking up, it'll, it could bring the good and the bad and the ugly mm -hmm. back to us. People are going to say things. It's going to be a repeat of round one. Mm -hmm of 1995 when my father was arrested. And mind you, obviously I've been vocal and public. I've had the show Monster in My Family on Lifetime. Um, I did the podcast Happy Face and Happy Face Presents Two-Face. Like I haven't... You've told the story. Mm -hmm. You've been very public about your story. Yeah. But it's another thing to be public with your story on a breaking case mm -hmm. where everybody has a microscope on this family mm -hmm. because they're going to be speculating. And so it's a different situation in that regards. Yeah. My with my dad, it's adjudicated, it's over. He was found guilty. They're still in the beginning phases of of you know, they just charged Rex Hewerman. Yeah. Um Anyway, so, so it's like where you were back in 1995, and I know that you spoke with your husband Steve and your kids, and they gave you their blessing. They did to go forward and get involved and and help. Yeah, so that was the first hurdle. 
like just I wanted their blessing. The second hurdle is I wanted Asa's blessing mm-hmm. because who wants to be a charity case? Who wants somebody to give unsolicited help? Yeah. And um, so I posted a TikTok video saying, hey, why don't we start a GoFundMe for Asa? And the reason why I GoFundMe is because I could tell that she was financially destitute. Mind you, that's not what the public thought. The yeah, public heard... She was an architect and a business owner. Yeah, that's what they heard. And that they had multiple houses. But what the public, I felt, was missing is that she filed for a divorce immediately. And anybody who's been through a divorce knows that there's a financial restraining order that happens. You cannot sell your assets mm-hmm. in the middle of a divorce. You can't liquidate anything. No, but when the feds are involved... Oh, it's another level. There's a freeze on assets. And so if she did have any assets or control of any of those assets prior to the feds coming in, she now doesn't. What I think we should do in a later episode is how to divorce a serial killer episode because yes, I think it needs to be explained on the complexities of what happened when you're divorcing somebody who's in prison and they're under investigation. Because it's, it's very not different the same. than just the standard divorce yeah. that you and I have gotten yeah. <laughs> before. Knowing you, Melissa, and us being friends and knowing your background, it made perfect sense to me that you, this case hit different for you than it does for me and for virtually everybody else. And it makes perfect sense that you would be somebody who would want to get involved. I know your intentions and I know all the work that you've done since your whole world was blown to pieces in 1995. I know all the work you've done for survivors um, and family members of killers. So I think what you're doing is extremely admirable. And I do want to have you kind of like walk me and the listeners through what's transpired after you were able to get in touch with Asa. Um, And we'll do that at the end. And uh, I really want to talk about the GoFundMe because that's the most important piece. Um, But so a little background as far as where I'm at with this case. A few years ago, I covered the Lisk uh, serial killer case, Gilgo Murders case on my podcast, Murderish. And I've always been interested in it. It's just a... um, horribly tragic case. And I think that my interest in it lies, I probably share a lot of other people's interest, all the usual stuff. But the fact that um, the victims are mostly all or all um, sex workers and as a vulnerable all, group of vulnerable people. women. Uh, and actually there was a, a, a male found as well that may or may not be connected. Um, but vulnerable women who don't get the same treatment when they go missing or get murdered. They just don't. And that that actual thing happened in this case. Um, and I'll, I want to walk you through the case, even though I know you know about the case. Um, I'm going to walk you through it, what we know. So we'll start from the beginning and lead you up all the way up to present day. And then I would love for you to kind of walk us through which how is, you've become connected. Which is great because um, to be really honest with you, I didn't follow this case and I knew nothing about this case when I reached out to Asa. And I didn't feel like I had to know anything about the case because I knew what it's like to be a family member of a, a serial killer. That's your interest in this case. Yes. So given your background. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you walking me through the case is actually really helpful because I don't know. This is going to give you a lot of background and it'll probably have your wheels spinning based on what you know, because there's some things that you know that the public does not know as well. And you can just talk about whatever you're comfortable with at this point. Um, But yeah, let me walk you through it. So, you know, essentially on this whole thing started on May 1st of 2010, 24 year old Shannon Gilbert arrived uh, in Oak Beach on Long Island, New York around 2 a.m. And she was there to see a client because Shannon Gilbert is an escort at the time. Um, She's from New Jersey. Sorry, she's from Jersey City, New Jersey. Uh, She was there to see a client. And hours after arriving on Long Island, Gilbert makes this frantic and breathless 911 call. And she says on the call, it goes on for more than 20 minutes. I've listened to the whole thing. She says, they're trying to kill me. There's somebody after me. Um, And it's just this frantic and breathless call. And it just really seemed apparent that Shannon Gilbert was running for her life while she was on 911 call. Okay, I want to hear this. Kenny, you on the line? Stop. Stop it, please. Please, stop. Please, can you shut the door? No, time to go. Please. 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 
Go that way, please. Come on, let's go. Come on, roll that side. Come on, roll that side. No, please. Um, so she makes this, you know, frantic 911 call. They're trying to kill me. There's somebody after me. And it seemed obvious that Shannon Gilbert was definitely running for her life uh, during part of the 20 minute plus phone call. And more on that later. We'll go over the call in a little bit more detail. But that 911 call led to a string of grisly discoveries after that. It set off a 13-year investigation of a serial killer who goes by the monikers of the Lisk serial killer, which stands for a Long Island serial killer, the Gilgo Beach murderer, the Long Island Ripper. I think back in the day they were even calling him that. Why Ripper did he dismember the bodies? He did. There's been parts found oh. numerous times that are yeah. connected uh, to this case. Well, and so makes- on May 3rd of 2010, two days after Shannon Gilbert's 911 call, her boyfriend, Alex Diaz, calls her sister, Cherie. I think that's how you pronounce it, Cherie. And Diaz uh, says that Shannon had not been home in two days. And so he was worried about her. So Shannon Gilbert's mother, Mary Gilbert, reports her daughter missing. And this is where the sex worker thing comes in. Of course, they didn't, want to investigate this because she's a sex worker. Like, oh, they go missing all the time, apparently. But seven- Oh, I hate when they say, did she just run away? Do you think she just wanted to get a new life and run away? That, that, and that it, it, it's almost never the case. No. It's almost never the case. So seven long months later, there was a huge search for Shannon Gilbert, and it begins in Oak Beach where she was last seen and heard on the 911 call. They bring out canines, detectives, a dive team, everything. But instead of finding Shannon Gilbert, authorities stumble across evidence of a serial killer. And they really did quite literally stumble across it. In December of 2010, Suffolk County, there was a Suffolk County officer who was just out on a routine training uh, uh, call or you, you like a routine training exercise with a canine unit off the side of Ocean Parkway near Gil- Gilgo Beach. And just for proximity, Gilgo Beach is approximately nine miles from Oak Beach. So Shannon Gilbert was last heard on the 911 call. She was in Oak Beach. Gilgo Beach is where this officer from Suffolk County is with the canine unit, just doing some like training exercises. And they're about nine miles from each other. Now, underneath the dense brush in on Gilgo Beach or in Gilgo Beach, the officer found a disintegrated burlap sack. Inside were the skeletal remains of Melissa Bartholomew, 24-year-old petite, four foot ten woman from the Bronx. I should let you know that the burlap sack is a camo. It's not like Oh, it's not like the beige color, like no, the small. It's a no, camouflage. Like, it's camouflage. Did he Burlap. have a military background? Or, I mean, I not that it would matter, but... I don't know. I just want to, like, that is to camouflage the body. So Makes visually, sense. I just want you to know it's not... It's not beige. It's Because I'm picturing beige. Well, uh, like the burlap that people put in their farmhouse look, it's, you know... Camouflage. camouflage. Okay. That's interesting. Well, that make, he didn't want people to find these bodies, you know, the person that killed them. So two days later after... They find the remains of Melissa Bartholomew. Two days later, they find the remains of three more women. And that would be Maureen Brainerd Barnes, 25 years old. She's a single mother from Norwich, Connecticut. Amber Costello, 27 years old from Babylon, New York. And Megan Waterman, 22-year-old single mother from Hopog, New York. And these women, these four women would be referred to as the Gilgo Four. And It's, you know, later found out that all these women had a lot in common. You know, they had struggled financially and eventually became sex workers. And that's really... Did they fit a certain type? Are they petite? Are they... Uh, For the most part, from what I can see in photos, they're on the thinner side, mostly white women, um, younger in their 20s. Well, serial killers normally have a, a type. Yeah, and I can't wait to talk to... Dr. Michelle Ward about that. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I have read, you know, um, statistics that like Ted Bundy had a type, you know, it's been widely reported that it seemed like he had a type, but I don't know that they all have a type, but I think it's pretty common. My dad had a type. He liked really thin, wafy type of women. And my dad was six foot six. So I'm wondering if Rex Hewerman 
like petite, little, like smaller petite Easier women to control. for control. Yeah. Reasons. It's so dark, but uh, you know, if you're putting yourself in the mind of this serial killer, it would make sense on a practical level. And um, uh, from what I Dismembering and carrying a dead body is Carrying, really, dismembering, mm-hmm. and controlling. and From talking to experts, so I've been working in true crime for over a decade, and I've met n- numerous experts, and they've all expressed to me that um, a dead body is like three times the weight. It's really heavy. Yeah. So. Yeah, because they're, they're, it's, well, it's dead weight. You know, we've all mm-hmm. heard that, that it's oh. it's not as easy. I didn't put that like together. Hello, right? Dead weight. Yeah. Ooh, You're welcome. Ooh. Dropping all the knowledge here. You Dropping ruined all the knowledge. that slogan for me or that <laughs> whatever that you want to call that. The little <laughs> right. Dead weight. Ooh. But I mean, it is true. It's like, you know, <laughs> everybody thinks like, oh, yeah, like if I killed so-and-so, yeah, I could just pull their body. No, it's not that easy. So from a practical standpoint, maybe that was his type for practical reasons. I don't know enough about this case okay. to know that that was his type. But there was a case that I covered recently on Murderish, and that was the Nixium cult. Oh and yeah, and Keith Ranieri, he had a type, and not saying he's he's he very was a known serial killer, but he was a maybe a psychopath, maybe a sociopath. He was. Just I covered that shit. case when I worked on the Doctor Oz show. Okay, and I yeah, I knocked yeah. on his door to get oh, the my- story, and I went to the cult headquarters. Uh, Stop. Okay, that's a story for another day that we're going to need to dive into. I because that guy's a real pos. Alexis knows how I feel about him, which everybody feels this way about him. But going back to, he had a type. So these pieces of shit who go out and commit these heinous crimes. I mean, I, it's a thing. Like they often do have a type. So that that's an interesting insight that you bring up. Um, the people who knew the four women, the Gilgo Four, said that they were hired, they had been hired before they died uh, by a generous client on Long Island, and then they were never seen or heard from again. So that was kind of a tip, you know, early on that all these women were going to see, you know, a, a generous client on Long Island. So it's very specific. And um, all the women uh, had been dismembered, placed in a burlap sack, which we now know because of your insight that was more, it was camo. camo. Uh, and it was, and then they were hidden or submerged. So the killer did not want these women found. And it took years to find them. Weirdly that it was circumstantial, like the odds. I know. It just, he happened upon this, you know, it just, it wasn't supposed to happen. So interesting. And, and, you know, they put, and then here, and it's frustrating. And in Shannon Gilbert's case, they put out all this effort and came up with nothing at first, but then here, this canine, you know, exercise is going on and whoops. And then eventually you're going to find as we get further in, they do end up finding Shannon Gilbert. So we'll talk about that. Um, But this was essentially the biggest case in Long Island history, the FBI, ends up joining the investigation because, of course, and Nassau and Suffolk counties work together to investigate this case, although we would find out later that there was some infighting that caused delays on this case, uh, in this case. So more on that later. Between December 2010 and April of 2011, more bodies and more body parts are discovered along Ocean Parkway in Gilgo Beach. At that point, in total, there were eight sets of remains found. The Gilgo Four plus four more. Also found uh, during that search was a skull. um, They found a skull and garbage bags filled with bones on the side of the road, and they ended up IDing three more victims. Those victims included a female toddler, so heartbreaking, uh, between the ages of 16 to 32 months, uh, and they referred to her as Baby Doe. And so as it stands today, the total remains found that may or may not be connected to this case, but they were all found in the, you know, the same area. The total remains found are 11 bodies. I I say bodies, but there's parts, Mm -hmm. you know, um, but 11 people. And surprisingly, this was, is heartbreaking. The torso of Baby Doe's mother, who they call Peaches, was found 15 miles away from Baby Doe in a green Rubbermaid container at Hempstead Lake Park, Hempstead Lake Park in New York. Peach's extremities were found in 2011 during the Gilgo murders investigation. And what they did was Baby Doe and Peach's ended up being matched through DNA. So they find 
extremities from Peaches, the adult woman, uh, who still has not been identified as of today. And they realized that her torso had been found 10 years prior. And they also realized that Peaches is related, is the mother of Baby Doe, who was found as part of the Gilgo murders case. So if Peaches is one of the Gilgo victims, the same serial killer who killed the Gilgo four, that's dating back. To, now we're going back to uh, 10 years prior. In so now we're going back to 1997. So this case could go as far back as that if Peaches is a victim of the LISC. Okay, so I have a story for you. Yeah, please. So one of the first victims of my father was a woman named Dawn. And he, when um, he met her in California, she was with her baby and in the parking lot. And my father approached her and said he was a father. He had just been to my birthday party. And uh, they talked and he invited her into his car to drive her home with the baby, the baby boy. And he pulled over to the side, a secluded road, and said he needed to go to the bathroom. He, the uh, victim, Dawn, she gave a statement and said that he walked into the woods. When he returned, he had black eyes and he demanded oral sex. Black eyes, not like, an actual bruised eye, but no, his eyes were black. His eyes were black. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I'm really summarizing the story. Yeah, of course. I, it's always uncomfortable for me to share sure. a victim's story because um, it's their story. But I wanted but to just give. I wanted it. to. Yeah, she's told her story, but I wanted to share it only for the context of a baby being found next, you know, being related to another victim in the sense that my point is, is that um, my father attacked her. And my father gave the statement that later on that he uh, let her go because of the baby, let her live because he realized he would have to kill the baby. Uh -huh. And I'm sharing that because in this case, that could have happened with the Long Island serial killer is that when he picked up the sex worker victim, you know, that she had her child with her or toddler. Maybe he wasn't expecting it. I mean... If you, if you want to like paint up her, uh, a fuller picture, what could have happened a lot of times women have a hard time getting childcare. Mm -hmm. And what if she thought she could put her child, her toddler in a different area in a different room while she committed the sex act to get money because she didn't have childcare mm -hmm. and hence made herself and her child were not made herself a victim, but yeah, you know, got, became got, a victim. Found yeah. herself in the path of a very dangerous predator. Yeah. And yeah. And, and it's interesting that thank thank you for sharing that, by the way. Um it's interesting. God, I don't know, I'm crying. Sorry. She's gonna do a baby. Yeah. Sorry, I'll get over it. Okay. <sighs> I mean, it's really heartbreaking when you think about these women as real people, that they're mothers, that they're trying to make a living, that sex work is more lucrative than a minimum wage She's job. trying when to you have feed children. that baby. And yeah. she did not intend to put her baby in harm's way. It is a means of survival. And I just thought it was interesting that you said your father in that moment, he his conscience kicked in on some level. And he couldn't kill the baby. But, but those were his compartmentalization. So later we're going to talk to Dr. Michelle Ward. And what I have found working with serial killers is that they have compartments, like mm -hmm. their own rules of life. Like this is right. This is wrong. This is a yes. This is a no. Yeah. You are safe. You are not. Like the, these people are um, objects and could be discarded. Mm -hmm. And these people are not. So... It also could be that in a lot of crime cases where maybe the serial killer who, if, if it's a serial killer, whoever killed sure. this mother and, and toddler um, thought that this toddler could identify him. Yeah. And that's was always my thought too. It's like, well, you have to, this sounds so uh, 
terrible, but like you just have to get rid of all the witnesses. Yeah. Because he's self preservation. Yeah. yeah. So I've always thought it was very interesting that they connected peaches to baby doe. And um, they called her peaches because she had a tattoo of a peach with a bite taken out of it um, above one of her breasts. And peaches, in fact, remains unidentified as of today. Her skull has never been found. So March of 2011, a skull, some hands, and forearms are found. And DNA ends up matching those remains to a torso that was found in July of 2003, so several years earlier, by a woman who just was walking her dog. And oh, the, that's horrible. It's I feel bad for that lady. Well, can well you I imagine? feel bad for the victim, of course. Of like, course, but of course. I, it's all just so tragic. How, how traumatizing. Absolutely. I just cannot even imagine. And, um, you know, those dismembered- these people are just running into body parts and-, and it, it, Yes. There's no organized investigation. It feels like it just feels like, oh, oops. It's random. Wow, bodies. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, you know, bag after bag and burlap sack after burlap sack. And those dismembered parts that that woman walking her dog stumbled across um, were the, were 20 year old Jessica Taylor, who was an escort who vanished in 2003. And a week after Jessica Taylor was identified, this is interesting, the body of an Asian John Doe was pulled from brush about a quarter mile from the remains of Melissa, Amber, Maureen, and Megan, the Gilgo Four. So the Asian John Doe appeared to to have been dead for at least five years. His age was approximated at maybe 17 to 23 years old. Oh, really young. He was young, like the others. He was wearing women's clothing at the time of his death, and uh, he may have also been an escort. I think they found some evidence that maybe he was an escort. He doesn't seem to fit the standard type. However, power and control and... Well, there's some interesting things that you're... So the Asian John Doe is interesting to me because there's two schools of thought, which... um, And by the way, his identification is also still a mystery today. He's just the Asian John Doe. And um, one theory, because the Asian John Doe, as dark as it is, he was found with his head crushed. His head had been bashed in. One theory was that the killer felt duped when they discovered that he was actually a man. That was my first thought. So that that's an interesting theory. Like, you know, he was dressed in women's clothing and maybe he was it was a rage killing. However, the the internet searches that we know that the man who was arrested uh recently, Rex Huberman, did, um, there were some internet searches specifically for an Asian man. Really? Yeah, that's and I and I'm like paraphrasing. I, uh, maybe I have the direct, you know, the exact search, but he did thousands and thousands of searches, just very disturbing searches, and one of them had to do with an Asian man. So there it is, know, right? Potentially, potentially. On December thirteenth of twenty eleven, Shannon Gilbert's body is finally found in the marshlands in Oak Beach, which is on Long Island. And it had been a year and a half after she went missing, uh, after she made that heart-wrenching 911 call running for her life. And it was about a year after the Gilgo Four had been found. So the Gilgo Four were found a year later. Shannon Gilbert, who was really responsible for the Gilgo Four, you know, being found, um, she's found a year after the Gilgo Four. And, you know, I just want to take the time right now to say that you know, in my mind, you know, my opinion, these victims were not defined by their sex work, right? They were, for example, Melissa Bartholomew, a victim, she graduated from cosmetology school. She moved to Buffalo, New York, which is a small town. Uh, She moved from Buffalo, New York to New York City, the Big Apple. She had all these hopes and dreams. She thought that moving to the Big Apple would help toward that goal of working in cosmetology, She went and rented herself a a basement apartment in the Bronx, but the high cost of new, you know, living in New York really wore on her. At the same time, her boyfriend, Johnny, who was known by pimps as Blaze, got her into sex work in 2006. So she had all these hopes and dreams of working this traditional job of her dreams. She meets this guy. He's integrated with these pimps. He gets her into sex work. And, you know, Melissa is last seen sitting on the curb outside her apartment on uh, the afternoon of July 10th of 2010. I'm sorry, July 10th of 2009. And Blaze, her boyfriend, 
had told authorities that Melissa had an overnight job with a client on Long Island the day she disappeared. So was again, that boyfriend arrested. I hope he was just arrested. I know because you know, he's, he's the one a, who got her into sex work. Yeah. And, you know, it's just terrible. And it led, uh, ultimately led to her death. And he's a pimp. He's a pimp. Exactly. Like, why arrest the sex workers? Why not arrest the pimp? pimp? Yeah. The pimp. Right. Yeah. If go, you're gonna, go up the if chain. If you're going to do that, I mean, first of all, that's a whole nother conversation about legalizing sex work. Mm-hmm. But um, the fact that the women are jailed more than the John Doe's. Yeah. Like, yeah, or, it happens all the time. And, you know, certainly it sounds like from her background, this is not what she, you know, wanted to do. It's something that he girl sort of pushed of her that. into. And she found herself out of money. And one thing led to another. She got into sex work, but she is not defined by that. And her family certainly knows so much more about her. And they probably don't think of her as, oh, she was a sex worker that got killed. Surprise, surprise. No, she was a family member and she had people who loved her and she had hopes and dreams just like you and I did and do. Well, I love that you're telling me about her because there's a lot of places in the media where they don't focus on the lives of the victims. And I feel like that's really important to know who they are. Because we're going to know everything about Rex Hewerman there is to know. But how much are we going to know about these women? Blaze told authorities, like I said, so it's interesting because, you know, uh, her going to see a client on Long Island matches what all the other women were also going to do. They were meeting a client on Long Island. So people are like, yeah, so of course, Melissa, she seems like she would be connected to this case. Um, But the, of course, the NYPD dismissed Melissa's mother when she reported her daughter missing, just like what happened with Shannon Gilbert, told her they weren't really going to assign a detective since Melissa was a sex worker, just straight up. She's not as equally human as you and me. If you go missing tomorrow, I guarantee you there'll be law enforcement on it pretty darn quick because you're not a sex worker. Mm -hmm. It's really sad. Chillingly, for several days after Melissa went missing, her little sister received some very unsettling phone calls. The calls actually came from Melissa's cell phone, and she was already missing at this point. It was a male voice on the other end that told her little sister that Melissa was a whore. Five more calls came in, that same male voice, what we suspect, you know, who we suspect was the killer, Melissa's killer. He had talked about the sexually explicit acts that he'd done to Melissa. He's reliving it. Yeah. He's sadistic, it sounds. I mean, I'm not an expert, but. And he wanted to torture the family. It's about control. Look at, I have her phone. Evil. Yeah. Just pure. Well, he, it wasn't enough to kill her. He wanted to have somebody know that she suffered. Yeah. And he wanted to degrade her. Right. He wanted to let her family members know she's just a whore. And Well, that um, I worked on a case. Um, I got an email from a woman in Jennings, Louisiana, and she said, my father is a suspected serial killer. And I went down to, to the town in Louisiana, and I started to investigate that there's eight sex workers, again, same story, different case, um, and how this serial killer would leave the bodies is that he would leave them nude with their legs spread out to embarrass Mm -hmm. the corpse, the woman. Yeah, he Um, posed them. He posed them. So instead, the serial killer is calling and taunting the family as a way of shaming versus the... Mm -hmm. The poses of the body. Yeah. Anyway, so um, it's that real, yeah, so it, that case is a documentary on Discovery ID, Jennings Eight. Okay. Well, I, I, the, it is a thing that they do. We have watched enough true crime documentaries and listened to enough podcasts to know that there are very sick, sick people out there. That, like you said, it's not enough just to kill. They have to degrade and they have to put on a show and they have to taunt and they're just very sadistic and evil and. You know, it's like they get off on it and it's, it's pretty sick. Those calls that we think was the killer, let's just, you know, the killer made to Melissa's family member, those calls were actually traced back to crowded parts of Midtown Manhattan. I know that what you know, based on the, that doesn't, that doesn't surprise you. Uh, But the final phone call from the man on the other end, uh, came on August 26th of 09, and the man said that he'd killed Melissa. Law enforcement was unable to identify the mystery caller at the time. 
three days after Maureen Brainerd Barnes went missing in 2007, her cell phone had pinged off of a cell tower just a few miles from Gilgo Beach. Someone had actually tried to access Maureen's voicemail. So essentially, after she went missing and was presumed dead, her killer tried to access her voicemail. To leave a, to leave a, um, you know, a, a message, not like, no, to leave the recording that you hear when you call I think or to listen to her messages. To see if people were calling to look for her. Oh. That's what I think, but I don't know. It could be where it's he also, wanted to leave some creepy message. You never know. Like, we can't get into this person's head, but it's just a really extra step to be using their cell phones and trying to get their voicemail and listen to their voice and call their family members and taunt them. It's just a real, it's a real piece of shit for lack of a better term. Um, and of course there's patterns among the Gilgo murder victims. They were all sex workers. Most or all of them advertised on Craigslist and Backpage. They experienced a lot of life challenges, uh, tumultuous home life, drug addiction, some of them had boyfriends, more than one of them, who pushed them into sex work. Um, many of them worked traditional jobs prior to sex work. And most or all of them were contacted by a man, a client, on a burner phone. And these women who uh, who died traveled to Long Island to see this generous client. So there's, there's a lot of patterns here. In Shannon Gilbert's final moments, she unknowingly set off an investigation that would break this Gilgo case wide open. And I have to say, her mother, Mary Gilbert, pushing and pushing and pushing law enforcement, like, you will investigate my daughter's disappearance because they didn't want to, and it took them seven months. I think Mary Gilbert deserves a lot of credit for where we are in the investigation today, which is somebody's been arrested and may very well be responsible for these murders. If Mary Gilbert hadn't pushed, what a mom! I just, a mom. You, you just, can, you could feel mm -hmm. it. Like I have chills thinking about her. Again, her daughter isn't a sex worker. Her daughter's her daughter. She misses her just as much as you would miss your daughter, and I would miss my daughter. It doesn't matter no. what they did to make money. I, you miss them just the same. And so, I just wanted to. And there's an update, a very tragic update with regard to Mary Gilbert, which I want to get into that you, you may find pretty shocking. Um, and so really how it all began, going back to Shannon Gilbert, around two in the morning on May 1st of 2010, a man named Michael Pack was a driver for Shannon Gilbert, who was an escort. And he drove her on that day on May 1st, 2010. He drove her from Jersey City to Oak Beach, which is about a 90-minute drive. But she was willing to do it because it was for a $1,500 job. So it was a big job. And she was like, the drive is worth it. That new client that Michael Pack drove Shannon Gilbert to see was Joseph Brewer, a 47-year-old recently separated bachelor. Okay, oh. so that was her client. <laughs> Now, Michael that's Pack. That's not Rex Hewerman. That's not Rex Hewerman. So, Michael Pack parks his black SUV outside of Brewer's home and waits for Shannon. And around three o'clock in the morning, Shannon made six quick phone calls to Michael Pack, and they see this on the phone records. She ended up asking him uh, to buy lubricant and some playing cards. Pack said that he refused. He said, You know, I'm not familiar with this area. I don't want to go looking around in the dark for this stuff that you want. And it's reported, I don't know for sure, but it's a, it's been reported that Brewer, the client, he may have driven Shannon that night to the store for lubricant or other items that may or may not have happened. And it's unknown what happened when the client, Joseph Brewer and Shannon Gilbert, got back to Brewer's house, but something made Shannon panic at a certain point inside that house. Around 4.30 in the morning, Brewer, the client, calls Michael Pack, the driver. He demands that he get Shannon out of his house. He wanted her out of the house immediately. Wait, the client tells the driver he wants yeah. her out immediately? Yeah, and Shannon had been with him for a few hours at this point. But something happened, and Brewer, the client, is now calling the driver saying, get her out. 
Okay, so he seems like he's not a suspect. You're going to form more opinions as we go on for sure. So Brewer actually tried to forcibly remove Shannon from his house, but she went and hid behind his couch. She was afraid of something. She calls 911 from inside Brewer's house, hiding behind the couch, and says she did not want to leave the house. She refused to leave the house. Something outside was very scary to her, and we're going to get more into this. In the beginning of that 911 call that Shannon makes, she repeatedly says, there's somebody after me. There's somebody after me. But she's saying it someone cal- somewhat calmly and quietly, I would say. If you listen to the tape, she's not like, there's somebody after me. She's, there's somebody after me. And the 911 caller is like, wait, what? You know, And she's like, there's somebody after me. She's behind the couch making this call. You can hear Brewer, the client, in the background telling Shannon that, okay, hey, and I'm paraphrasing, okay, just based on what I heard. You could hear him with his accent, like his East Coast, the Long Island accent. And he's saying, all right, I'm going upstairs now. You know, you can leave now. You can leave. And she's not leaving. You can hear him in the background saying this. And then you can hear the driver, Michael Pack, in the background coming up to Shannon and almost kind of like giggling a little bit. He's like, are you okay? This is weird. I mean, he's this like, is really it, weird. I'm yeah, not following this situation. I can't make this. It's going to be bizarre. It's it's. There's a lot of different conclusions that you can draw, but there's more. Okay. So, Michael Pack, the driver, who Shannon's very familiar with, he drove her to this, you know, job that he probably drove her to others. They knew each other well. He's going up to her, and he's in Brewer's house, and he's just like, are you okay? And he's telling her, it's me, Michael. And Shannon says, what do you, she says to Michael Pack, presumably, she says, what are you going to do to me? Are you going to kill me? And then Pack says, are you crazy? He's like, let's go back to, and again, I'm paraphrasing on this one. He's like, are you crazy? Like, let's just, let's go back to Manhattan. We're near the water. We're on the ocean. And, you know, I have to stop and say something that for a sex worker to call 911, That's a big deal because the last thing a sex worker wants to do is call law enforcement because they are doing something that's against the law. I had to explain themselves and get arrested. And get arrested. So in my mind, Shannon Gilbert must have been extremely afraid to take that step. It's just my take on it. Is there any connection between Rex Hewerman and this client? That I don't know. But I wonder if it could come out later. But after you hear a little more, maybe you won't wonder that, but maybe you will. So Shannon, in in my mind, if you listen to the 911 call, Shannon doesn't seem afraid of Joseph Brewer, the client. She wants to stay inside of his house. Uh, she didn't want to go. What my take is that she did not under any circumstances, want to go outside into the total darkness at 4.30 in the morning in an unfamiliar place. She was scared of something outside, not inside the house. That's my take. Where in Long Island are you? I don't know. They're going to kill me. Are you in a house? Are you in a house? Yeah. Whose house is it? I don't know. Who is Mike? What's his last name? Mike what? How old are you? What's his last name? I hate to not play the entire thing because you can take things out of context if you only hear, you know, bits and pieces. So I encourage anybody who's listening right now, go listen to the entire 20 plus minute call. It's going to be very insightful. Um, it is hard to listen to it at times. Can we have a link? Um, can we have a link? No, can we put a link on our show description? Yes. For people to listen to yes. it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. We'll leave a link to the audio uh, in our show notes. So if you're listening right now, go to our episode notes. There will be a link there, and I encourage everybody to listen to it. Um, And what was interesting is it took authorities 12 years to release this 911 call. Why? Why 12 years? They kept saying, this is part of an active investigation. We can't, you know, which I think is always like the go-to when you don't want to release something. And you so you, you're, you're, 
your knee jerk is just to say like, oh, it's part of the active investigation. Well, but they did that with the Delphi, the Delphi girls that were murdered. They didn't release all of the the clips from the phone or the audio. And you can understand yeah. it at a certain point, I think. But I guess a, a large the public seems to me largely believes you were stalling for other reasons. But Maybe not. Maybe they really were like, hey, this is an active investigation. But a lot of people are like, you really weren't actively investigating this thing at that time. So, you know, I guess it could go either way. But the fact is they didn't release it for 12 years, but it is out now. Now, at a certain point, Shannon did leave the house, but she's still on the phone with a 911 and she runs. I mean, she runs and she's on the phone. You can hear her like, <sighs> like running. Okay. And she's running while she's on the phone with 911. Uh, she's on the phone with him for more than 20 minutes. And you have to really understand that Shannon is running in complete darkness it, over sand dunes through really tall, tangled reeds. She, I believe she was barefoot for part or all of it because her shoes were found and I'm telling you, these reeds are like this tall. So she's running. I, I imagine you could become very disoriented, like very quick. She's in an area she's not familiar with. She's 90 minutes from home, but she runs and she's in total darkness and she stays on the phone with 911. She runs and reaches the door of 75-year-old Gus Coletti around five o'clock in the morning. Coletti opens the front door. He sees a terrified Shannon Gilbert on his front porch. And you can hear him because she's still on the phone with 911. Wow. This is all captured? All of it's captured. And you can wow. very clearly hear him with his accent. You know, we're from Southern California. So I picked up on, you know, on the accents. He's like, um, he asks her like, what's wrong? Is somebody after you? And she's basically like, doesn't say much to him. You can kind of hear her grunt or something, but there really were not a lot of words exchanged between them. But he's asking her, you want to come inside? Like, are you okay? Is somebody after you? And she just takes off running again. Okay. But she's still on the phone with 911. Is Moments she on later. Drugs? Is huh? she on drugs? No drugs were found in her system. Okay. That's, autopsy. That comes in later. Okay. So that's why right. this is- I'm just like, that's the first thought in my head. Me is too. Like, is, too. Is she having a, a mental episode? Yeah. yeah. They, that, they, you would you would think that, but it's just like a paranoia episode. Yeah. I mean, no drugs were found in her system during the autopsy. Wow. So moments later, after Shannon Gilbert takes off running again from that 75-year-old Gus Coletti's house, a black SUV appears at Gus Coletti's house. A small framed Asian man matching Michael Pack's description, who is Shannon Gilbert's driver, who we talked about earlier, pulls up, asks Coletti if he'd seen a girl running. And Coletti says, yeah, and she seemed very upset. Coletti further tells Pack that he's already contacted emergency services, to which the Asian man who fits Pack's description replies, you should not have done that. She's going to be in a lot of trouble. Now, then, Shannon, after she leaves Coletti's house, she's still on the phone with 911. This is, a, this is very confusing. Yes, it is. This has been the biggest. And, you know, I'm going to jump ahead. To this day, Shannon Gilbert has not been connected officially to the Gilgo case. And in fact, the Suffolk County police or law enforcement, they don't believe she's connected to the case. They believe she uh, accidentally drowned in the marsh that night. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. Yeah. Th this is going to have your wheels spinning. It is. Th they After, are. It, it's, <laughs> they it's are very, spinning. But Shannon was obviously afraid of something. She's running for her life, it seems like. She runs to another woman's house named Barbara Brennan. She lives in the same neighborhood as Gus Coletti. She runs to the house. Barbara hears the knocks on the door, calls 911. While she's on the phone with 911, the most eerie thing is that you can hear Shannon Gilbert's knocks on the door. And they're frantic and they're loud. Oh, no. It just, it just gave me chills when I was listening Where to it. Where is that call? Do That's we have a link to that link. as well? The oh. link that I have is going to have all of this on it. Wow. Yeah. It's the entire 911 call that goes on for more than 20 minutes. And that call, there were three, a total of three 911 calls, Shannon Gilbert's, uh, Barbara Brennan, and Gus Coletti. They all called separately. And those are all, I believe, available. I know that I heard Barbara Brennan's. Mm -hmm. I heard Gus Coletti's voice on Shannon Gilbert's call. 
I don't think that I've heard Gus Coletti's call to 911, but he may have made it after Shannon left. I, that's my impression. So Barbara calls 911. You can hear knocking on the door as she's saying to the 911 oper- operator, and I'm paraphrasing, she says like, somebody's knocking on my door, but I'm not going to let her inside because there's a, a woman on her porch knocking frantically. And this elderly lady, I don't know how old she was, but she seemed to be a bit elderly. She's not going to answer the door. She doesn't know this woman, but she does the right thing. And she calls 911. So she never opens the door for Shannon. You can hear Shannon knocking, but Shannon does in fact, eventually just leave and takes off running again, which is still being caught. Her breathless running is being caught on this 911 call that just goes on for 20 minutes. And this, the, the awful thing is that you hear the last human contact that Shannon Gilbert had before she died, right before she died. Because what happens is Shannon runs off again from that lady neighbor's house. And there are these tall weeds, tall ocean weeds, the reeds, I think is what they're called. And they're very tall. They look to me like they're as tall as us. But you see on a map that there's this thin trench, almost like somebody took I'm not using the right terms, but like a lawnmower and cut a little path, like a long path. And I had read later that they did that like for mosquito prevention or something like that. So it's theorized that Shannon ran along that path with these tall, you know, weeds on the each side of her in total darkness. And that was on December 13th of 2011. You can hear really heavy breathing as Shannon continues running. There's no talking. It's just... <sighs> Like you're, she just will not stop running. Okay. Shannon's body would not be found until a year and a half later on December 13th of 2011. Wait, wait. In that March. What's the end of the 911 call? How does it end? The ending, if I can remember correctly, is her running through the marsh, but not saying anything. During part of the call, you can hear Shannon's blood curdling screams. And I, my theory is that that's when she saw the SUV approaching or she saw, she was afraid of something and she's like, ah, ah, like blood high pitched. But I think the end of the call, if I'm remembering correctly, is just her breathing hard and running. And then her body's found in that marsh a year and a half later. Well, if you're running and hiding, you're not going to scream. But if you're captured, you're going to scream. Yeah. So something, and that happened before the last part of the call, like she screams at some point. So something scares her. Mm -hmm. And Gus Coletti, in fact, reported that when the black SUV pulled up, which was being driven supposedly by Michael Pack, Shannon's driver, because he, he, described him and he matched the description that Shannon went and hid behind a boat. She did not want to be found. And so it seems apparent she didn't want to go with Michael Pack, who she knew well, who drove her to the job. Okay. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about Michael Pack a little soon. Yeah. This is uh, it's it's all really over the place, right? Mind baffling. Yes. So Suffolk County police fought to keep that 911 call, Shannon Gilbert's call, hidden. And they cited it's part of an active investigation, but the Gilbert family was having none of it. And they fought to get access to that 911 call. It took 12 years, like we talked about earlier, but they believed it could lead to Shannon's killer. Now, the Gilbert family hounded police to investigate Shannon's disappearance. And again, like I said earlier, it took them seven months, but they finally did. Joseph Brewer, the 47-year-old client that brought Shannon or Shannon went out to Gilgo Beach for, um, he came under strong suspicion, of course, at first in her murder. Yeah, you have to look at him. He was one of the last people. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so he came under strong suspicion. The FBI, on de- in December of 2010, the police, the FBI surround his home. And uh, he is, in fact, his home is located only three miles from where four sets of remains were found. So, of course, he's a suspect. Plus, he, you know, Shannon was at his house. Wait, are there multiple killers operating on Long Island? That's been theorized. Okay. So Brewer actually was cooperative with investigators. He claimed he had nothing to do with Shannon's disappearance. And after questioning and a search of his Oak Beach home and seizing his vehicle, he's ruled out as a suspect. Okay. So if he's totally innocent, 
You That's hear traumatizing. Him, it is. And you hear him on the call. Like, it seems pretty obvious he did not kill Shannon Gilbert. He wanted her out of the house. You can hear him. So Shannon's driver, Michael Pack, also um, came under suspicion. And he claimed that he drove around for hours that night looking for her, finally gave up around dawn and ended up driving home. Early on in the investigation, uh, they did clear Michael Pack as a suspect. And... You know, I will say after listening, Shannon seemed to be running away from Michael Pack because at one point you can hear her on the call while she's in Brewer's house and she's talking to Michael Pack. She's like, you're in it all along. In what? Like you were in it all along. That's what she says to him. I don't know what she's talking about, but you've got to listen to the call. Mm -hmm. So... Of course, when I first, you know, covered this case, I thought, God, Michael Pack had something to do with this. She's running from him. She clearly does not want to go home. Otherwise, she would have gotten into his SUV and got out of Dodge, but she didn't. She didn't want to be with him. She didn't want to leave Joseph Brewer's house. She didn't want to go with Pack, who she knew well. So it's all very mysterious, but Pack was cleared as a suspect. Now, back to back to the 2010 investigation, a criminal profile of the killer was developed. They determined that it's likely a man in his mid-20s to mid-40s, highly intelligent, wealthy, with a highly sadistic streak. Compare that to who's been arrested. Potentially, they also said this man is the killer is potentially a seasonal visitor of Long Island, uh, Gilgo Gilgo Beach, specifically because all the victims disappeared between Memorial Day and Labor Day. Now, okay, summertime. Yes, all right, that's when families go on vacation. Thank you. That specifically his family. I'm talking about Rex right now. My mind is going toward we know for a fact that many of these women were killed while Asa, his estr- Rex's estranged wife was out of town. So, it would make sense to me that she would go out of town on holidays. Maybe, maybe not. And then he would go and kill. Now, obviously, this is just a theory, but it is a fact that... It would make sense because um, for serial killers, you don't want any leakage of your double life. So he would have to explain, especially if he's dismembering them, he'd have to explain blood, evidence, or like the bloody car or blood. It's a lot on, of time yeah. and effort yeah. to do these things. And he needs privacy to operate. Um Maybe he's not killing the victims in his home, but he needs privacy to just discard any evidence. And having a wife who's questioning, hey, why are you bloody? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) It it makes sense. Why did you have bloody pants in the washing machine? Right. Exactly. He needs to be able to hide this as best as possible. I will say serial killers have some really incredible excuses. I worked on a case where Robert Yates... Um, told his children that the blood in the car after a victim was that he helped an injured dog off the road. So, I mean... Yeah. They have uh, to make up these excuses for mm -hmm. the dirty things that they're doing. Right. And he just... uh, If if it's true, if Rex truly is the serial killer, then he, you know, he's alleged right now. Um, But if it's him, then that was... That was why. He didn't want to have to explain it to his family. Makes sense. Shannon Gilbert's autopsy revealed no drugs in her system. So, uh, and her cause of death, undetermined, sadly. Um, Suffolk County police said that she drowned accidentally. They theorized that Shannon became disoriented and entangled in the tall thickets, accidentally drowned in the marsh. Um, That seems kind of weird. It seems weird. That doesn't seem that possible. Right. And she seemed very coherent in these 911 calls. So it's not like she was like out of it. It didn't seem like it. Now, to their point, maybe you could become disoriented in this marsh. Maybe not. But she was afraid of something. She was afraid of something. So, And no drugs found in the system. That said, the Gilbert family wanted a second autopsy because they're like, this is a homicide, right? Uh, They got their chance for a private autopsy. Uh, Because her death was listed as undetermined and they were not satisfied with that. They got their chance with renowned pathologist and former chief medical examiner of New York City, Dr. Michael Baden. Now, Dr. Baden, uh, he had worked on really high profile cases in the past like JFK, Nicole Brown Simpson, Ronald Goldman, uh, Aaron Hernandez, and Sid Vicious. So he's a very high profile pathologist. Dr. Baden 
conducts the autopsy on Shannon Gilbert. And while, while he still, while her death is still undetermined, he says that due to her missing larynx and fractures in the neck, that Shannon's death is consistent with homicidal strangulation. That's what he concluded. Suffolk County police still maintain that Shannon's death may not or is not tied to the Gilgo 4 case. So they're not tying it, you know, to that. But the family believes that it, it, that it is. But he's the reason why, from my understanding, so I haven't been following the case, but the one thing, um, you know, I will talk about flying to Long Island and meeting Asa. And before I met Asa, I was wondering why did this take so long to to arrest Rex Hewerman and the one thing that that stood out in articles was just about this character. Mm. So I didn't know anything about Shannon or any of the other victims. I just ended up falling on this particular asshole. Yeah. <laughs> James Burke, former Suffolk County police chief, reportedly kept the FBI in the dark uh, and limited their involvement in Shannon Gilbert's case. So he is an asshole as far he as I'm concerned. He might have had... People say... He well, might have been with her before. Okay, well, we're going to, let me just, you just might have hit the nail on the head. People basically say that he is responsible for botching the case. Burke resigned in October of 2015, and then details about his extracurricular activities emerged, uh, which made the Gilbert family think of him as a potential suspect in Shannon Gilbert's murder. Burke was rumored to have had participated in wild sex parties with escorts. Okay. These parties went down in the same area where bodies were later found and during the time he was police chief. In 2011, an escort came forward, previously worked at Burke's, at Burke's sex party. She signed an affidavit, said in a press conference that Burke was rough with women and he was domineering. In 2016, five years later, Burke is in fact sentenced to 46 months in federal prison for conspiring to cover up an assault. Basically, he had attacked a, a drug addict in custody who'd broken into Burke's car and stole a duffel bag. And what was inside? It was full of sex toys and porn. Okay, so I pulled up this morning the New York Post. It's August 22nd. Disgraced ex-Suffolk County police chief who botched Gilgo Beach case and beat up porn thief. Porn thief? Porn thief. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> Way to like make it succinct. Oh, I should have just said the porn, porn thief. thief. <laughs> he is now known as the porn the thief. The porn thief. That's <laughs> hey, somebody had to do I it. I love you, New York Post. Yeah, somebody had oh to do it. Oh my gosh, you did him dirty. <laughs> well, and no no charges were ever fi ever filed against this asshole Burke. Uh, you know, for his well, potential he to, obstruction of well, Shannon Gilbert's investigation. Well, yeah, on that part. But he went to federal prison for beating a crook who stole his dildo yeah. and porn stash. Yeah. Can you imagine that's what he that's what you go to prison for? Like, if I'm gonna go to prison, I want it to be something so badass, but also like kind of valiant. Yeah. Like Jamie Rice went to prison because she beat the shit out of a dude who'd attacked another woman in her presence. Like, oh, yeah. I, you know, what I mean? like I wanted to be something valiant and badass, but this guy went to prison because he a had dildo. a dildo. <laughs> Not the dildo. <laughs> Not the dildo sending right. you to prison. So James Burke. Yeah. 59 so James Burke. Was picked yeah. up in Sofix County, Vietnam Veterans Memorial Park in Farmington, uh, sorry, Farmingville by park rangers at about 10, 15 a.m., for soliciting for soliciting sexual engagement. Uh <laughs> so he was into sex workers, but and he came under suspicion as far as the the uh Shannon Gilbert's family are concerned. But as we all know, there's been an arrest and it wasn't that guy. Okay. So the Rangers didn't know who Burke was. Oh. This just happened. Like literally, yeah. this just happened. So the Rangers didn't know who Burke was until he identified identified himself and tried to worm out of the arrest by saying it would be a public humiliation. Um, the officers were not swayed. Too late. Authorities bro. later brought Burke to the sixth prison for processing, where he was charged with offering a sex act, public lewdness, indecent exposure, and criminal solicitation. Harrison said at a press briefing. Yeah, so he's, uh, yeah. he's a weirdo. Um, yeah. You know, we talked about it earlier that the Gilgo murders could go as far back as 1997, but it turns out they could go as far back as 1996, the year I graduated high school. Um, Wait, uh, uh, 
a year after my father was arrested. Right. You're always going to, when you said that, and, and the year your father was arrested was the year, I believe, that I heard the O.J. Simpson trial verdict that really shook October me. October 3rd, shook the world. 1995. Right. Uh, in 1996, there was a couple out for a walk, again, stumbling upon body parts. A couple was out for a walk on nearby Fire Island in New York. They found two severed legs wrapped in plastic. The legs were a DNA match to bodies found on Gilgo Beach between 2010 and 2011, which is when the other, like the Gilgo Four were found. So this body could be part of the case. That was found back in 1996. Parts were found. So this case could go as far back as that. Um, in Jan on January 16th of 2020, new evidence was released to the public, and this was big. The law enforcement released images of a belt that was found at the crime scene in 2011. On that belt, as you know, embossed in that belt in leather are the initials WH. And now this matches with Rex Hewerman, the man who stands charged with some of these murders, right, as of recently, matched Rex Hewerman's grandfather, William Hewerman, who died in 1964. So there's that WH. We don't know for sure. Maybe you do if that belt was Rex's grandfather's, but it certainly does match the initials. Interesting. And it was found on a body. Now, it's believed, of course, that this belt with the initials on it belonged to the killer, and people are still unsure to this day why Suffolk County Police, once again, waited nine years to release this information. And, I, you know, I think it may have been released just to show the families, like, hey, yeah, we are still working on this case. Look, look, we got this belt. I don't know. Now, property records show that Rex Hewerman and his family lived in the home that's become famous now, unfortunately which he bought from his mother, Dolores, for $170,000 in 1994. Oh, geez. This is where people are thinking that the family's wealthy. Yeah. Because 94, almost 200000 Is a decent price to pay. So what is the house worth now? Probably a mil I, I, or more? I know it's... I don't know. know. I don't know property values on east, over On there. the East Coast. Yeah. I don't know. Probably you know. quite a bit. Yeah. Now, here's a shocking aftermath. Um July 2016, Mary Gilbert, who is Shannon Gilbert's mother, the, the woman who sort of set this whole thing off, she'd fought hard to bring Shannon's killer to justice. Uh, now, Mary Gilbert was actually killed in July of 2016 by her own daughter, Sarah Gilbert. Now, this ended any chance for Mary Gilbert to ever see her daughter's killer brought to justice, which is just absolutely heartbreaking. And how she died is... is equally as heartbreaking. Um, her daughter, her own daughter, which would be Shannon Gilbert's sister, Sarah stabbed Mary Gilbert, stabbed her mother over 200 times. 200? Yeah. 200 it's a lot. times. It's a lot of effort to keep doing that. So this is like rage. You're, you're very angry, it seems like. And Sarah had a history of mental illness. And it came out that Sarah resented her mother, Mary Gilbert, for reporting her to authorities for drowning a puppy. Now, Sarah, um, Shannon Gilbert's sister, was found guilty of killing her mother, uh, second-degree murder. She was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Just a shocking, shocking turn of events uh, for Mary Gilbert. Now, July 14th of 2023 is the big day. On this day, as you had alluded to earlier, Melissa, this is big news. On this day, about a month ago from this recording... 59-year-old architect and business owner Rex Hewerman was arrested and charged with first and second degree murder of three women. And that would be Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Lynn Costello. Uh, he's also considered a prime suspect in the murder of Maureen Brainerd Barnes. These four women make up the Gilgo Four. So we have somebody in custody who may very well be this long sought after serial killer. All of these women that I just mentioned went missing between 2007 and 2010. Hewerman has pleaded not guilty. He was ordered by the judge to provide a DNA swab so that prosecutors can compare that DNA to uh, that uh, DNA that they had collected previously as part of this investigation. Which they found off a discarded pizza crust. Oh my gosh. I just, that whole tie-in. 
Authorities were able to catch up with Rex Hureman via a years-old witness report of a Chevy Avalanche pickup truck in Amber Costello's case. Uh, they also uh, found, you know, some did some subsequent DMV record searches, their cell phone evidence from burner phones and victim cell phones, as well as DNA from a discarded pizza crust. So let me walk you through quickly how this all went down. How did they connect Rex Hureman to the Gilgo case? So number one, in 2010, a man, a client, arrived at Amber Costello's house in West Babylon, New York for services on September 2nd of 2010. So she's an escort. He's there for Wasn't services. Wasn't there a bait and switch with this? Yeah, so exactly. Reports say that Amber's roommate confronted the male client uh, uh, after he threatened Amber, and then she then locked herself inside of a bathroom. The male client leaves, and the roommate tells police later after Amber's de- you know, uh, disappears that this male client left in a first-generation Chevy Avalanche truck, which the roommate thought was a bit unique. It was a different kind of looking truck it is. for the time. Yeah. And it is, because I've, I've seen it. it it's a unique um, body frame. It's ugly. It, it is. <laughs> so, based on interviews, uh, the witness, who was Amber's roommate, described the male client who left her house that day in his Chevy Avalanche truck. Um, described him as large, ogre, white male with em- with an empty gaze, approximately six foot four to six foot six in height, in his mid forties with dark bushy hair and big oval style 1970s type eyeglasses. And Sounds I just- Sounds like my dad. Oh my God. My dad's six foot six. They've called him a an ogre. Um, he has a wavy hair and he wears 1970s Dahmer glasses. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. you- that's just one of the many that weird? things that That's like weird that is you similar could, uh, about your dad's case to this. He was case. actually in his 30s when he was arrested. My dad was so. That's the only thing that. But that's that still pretty adjectives. similar. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to stop right here and just say this witness description and the previous profile crimin- uh, that criminal profilers did put together matched Rex Hewerman, the guy who's been arrested, to a T. He's a man. He was in his mid. He was in his forties when this all went down. Um, he's highly intelligent, as described by employees of RH Consultants, which is Rex Hureman's architectural firm. He may or may not have been wealthy, but we do know that he was a business owner of an architectural firm, so he had resources. Well, with financial highly- problems, from what I saw in the house. Okay. Yes. The severe. Severe. Was it reported the IRS? I don't know. He there was. Um, I went through his folders. Okay, so financial. He was experienced. So it's like they're describing him as wealthy. That could just mean that maybe a lot of income may have been coming in, or a lot yeah, is I relative. Think projects, but maybe uh, he doesn't do well with money. What I saw is his projects were about like two hundred forty thousand. You know, would be uh, like one client. Got it. Okay, yeah. so. He had the ability to be a wealthy man. You know, uh, now whether he was or not, I have not dived into his financial records, but this is just dead on. And the highly sadistic streak, we know by his internet searches, which we'll talk about, and those phone calls that he made to the victims. Like he, it, you know, if that was Rex Hewerman, this is a highly sadistic person. So, um, and what I will say is I'm here to say that Rex Hewerman is in fact an ogre. I mean, I'm, I don't care who... I, anybody's offended. I mean, he he just he does look like an ogre with empty eyes. Like it just it just matched him perfectly. So that's very eerie. And um, the roommate's tip gets buried for years, right? This is a really important tip. He may very well have come face to face with Amber Costello's and other women's murderer. He gives this tip, but it sort of gets buried for years and years about the Chevy Not Avalanche. Surprised. Not surprised. These are sex workers. It's unfortunate. Now fast forward to 2020. A hair recovered from a burlap sack uh, from Megan Waterman's body, which was found in December of 2010, was preserved as evidence for years. In 2020, forensic scientists generate a DNA profile for that hair. They determined it belonged to a male in mitochondrial haplogroup V7A. Scientists also conclude that numerous hairs found on Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello belong to a female 
in mitochondrial haplogroup K1C2. That hair comes into play later. And we're going to talk about that right now. Fast forward to March 2022, authorities go through mountains of evidence in the case just to kind of see like, hey, maybe we missed something in this Gilgo case. And this pays off. That's when authorities are able to narrow their search to Massapequa Park and Midtown Manhattan based on cell records. They take a second look at the previous witness account of the Chevy Avalanche parked at Amber's house. They search and they find a first-generation Chevy Avalanche registered to a man named Rex Hewerman. The truck matched the description Amber's roommate provided in 2010. This put authorities on to Rex Huberman as a suspect in Amber Costello's murder, and then a deep search ensues into Rex Huberman. After linking Huberman to the truck parked at Amber's house, investigators review cell phone records. This connected him to numerous burner phones used to plan meetings with three of the victims and to make menacing calls to Melissa Bartholomew's family member. Cell records show that the victim's cell phones are pinging, are pinging off of cell towers in the area of Massapequa, where Rex lived, and Manhattan, where Rex worked. So you can see how this is all yeah, it's all together. coming together. Like, bro, you're fucked. Yeah, I yeah. just don't know what else yeah. to say. Um, and in some instances, this is huge. Both the victim's cell phone and Rex's personal cell phone are pinging in the same area at the same time. So this is indicating that Rex potentially had the victim's cell phones on his person. There it is. Yeah. So court documents reveal that Hureman used his Amex in the same area where he called victims on burner phones. Also made calls on Maureen Brainerd Barnes' cell phone to check voicemail and con and contact Melissa Bartholomew's family members in the same areas where he used his Amex card and called victims on burner phones. So everything's tying in. Yeah, I see this. They're right? circling in. It's, it's um, very apparent. Very apparent. So then July 2022, detective retrie a detective goes to Rex Hewerman's house, retrieves 11 bottles from the trash can of Rex's home. Suffolk County Crime Lab swabs those bottles and sends the DNA I didn't know profiler. about that. I just thought about the pizza crust. That's what I heard. This is how they tied it. Oh, it's so got interesting. It. Got it. So after they collect the 11 bottles, send them off for DNA testing. Then they find also that Hureman had a Tinder account. Detectives linked this Tinder account back to his Amex card, which was used to make Google Play payments to Tinder. Now, follow me for just one second. I'm going to tie it all up right here. Tinder records show that Rex went by the name Andy on his Tinder profile. The Tinder profile, Andy, is linked to one of the burner phones linked to Rex Hewerman. The burner phone was linked to an email account that was created in 2011, and a search warrant on that email account revealed selfie photos likely taken by Rex Hewerman and sent to sex workers to solicit services. So... <sighs> There, how much? Like, tell me there it you is. are a serial killer without telling me you're a serial killer. I, I obviously he stands accused and and innocent before proving guilty, but I all I can just they've got I'm a very looking strong case. For, yeah, it's a very strong case. I'm looking forward to the trial to see how his uh, attorney spins this. Absolutely, this is going to be so. What I know about the justice system and about trials is like who has a better story, who has the most believable story. But yeah. now we have DNA, and DNA tells the story. It, it absolutely tells a story, and we've we've been with this DNA evidence thing for long enough to know that it's solid evidence. So basically, they find all these you know searches that Rex Hewerman apparently did thousands of internet searches. Not only was he searching into specific details for the Gilgo murders case, he was also searching very disturbing and detailed violent acts against a what I will say is a specific type of girl, some sometimes underage. I refuse to repeat here what those searches were because they're I'm it's hard. It's not good. So anybody who wants to go Google that, you can see, but I can tell you that his searches were deeply. Well, what deeply we could probably what what might be helpful to people listening in is if we put a link to the arrest 
warrant yes. paperwork and, and you can, can read, read it yourself. It. You can read everything that we've just discussed. And um, some of the reports out there are redacted. Some of them are not. But we could just have maybe the full unredacted document for those who, who want, want to seek it out. Yeah. I just don't want yeah. to trigger anybody. It's, it's, yeah. It's, and we, I mean, some people might not have head, have headphones on like yeah. we requested and there yeah. might be children listening. Yeah. We can just tell you that the information is out there. I can tell you with 100% certainty, it's deeply disturbing and disgusting. And so the information is out there if you'd like to, to read it. January 2023, a year after authorities discover the Chevy Avalanche registered to Hewerman, while they're doing surveillance, that team recovers a pizza box on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan outside of Hewerman's office, and they see Rex Hewerman outside of his office and discard the pizza box. So what do they do? Of course, they go pick it up. They find some pizza crust, which of course they send to the lab. February of 2023, a month, DNA testing from profiles created from one of the 11 bottles indicated, so on the one of the 11 bottles taken from the Hewerman's trash, indicated that a female individual belonging to mitochondrial haplogroup K1C2 uh, is connected to that bottle. This is the same mitochondrial haplogroup as female hairs found on three of the victims. Okay. Not the crust. So authorities believe that that female is Hewerman's wife, estranged wife, Asa. April of 2023, two months later, a male hair is, which is fa- which was found on one of the victims, is sent to the forensic lab for testing. A month later, surveillance footage shows Hewerman purchasing minutes for one of those burner phones. So this is just more evidence. Then in June of 20. 20- 2023, the lab concludes that male hair found on a victim and the pizza crust had the same mitochondrial DNA profiles, excluding 99.96% of the North American population. Let that sink in. What that means is that a hair found on a Gilgo victim has a DNA profile that matches pizza crust that they saw Rex Hewerman discard. And those DNA profiles can, those two DNA profiles can only belong to 0.04% of the North American population. And Rex Hewerman is in that tiny 0.04% population of people His based lawyer on the damn has pizza a lot crust. of work to do. <laughs> His lawyer. Your fuzz. Yeah. Excuse my language, but yeah, it, it's over. So this takes us to where we are today. You know, July of 2023, Hewerman is arrested and charged. He's currently on suicide watch. Um, you know, there was a lot of infighting between the agencies, which I'm sure caused delays in this case. Now, former high school classmates describe Hewerman as a recluse, very quiet, sometimes bullied, a loner. Apparently, he was bullied, and then he grew bigger, taller, and then certain people became afraid of him. There are accounts of him snapping. More women sex workers have come forward recently and talked about their interactions with Rex Hewerman. Nicole Brass, a former escort, described publicly. Oh, she- I've been talking to her. Okay, so yeah, here we, we can go. we can have her on the podcast if the listeners want her on. To that to would be talk. amazing. Yeah, well, she uh, escaped him, according to her report, which. I have no reason not to believe. So Nicole Brass, she's a former escort. She described publicly how she escaped an encounter with Hewerman sometime between 2014 and 2016. Brass said that Hewerman got excited when talking about the remains of the Gilgo murder victims. Um, There are employees. Yes, Yes, it's Nikki Brass. Is that, so you've been talking to her? I've been talking to Nikki Brass. She's a beauty, by the way. Yeah. She's so pretty and... um, yeah, I'll message her and see if she would like to join us to have a conversation. Yeah. Well, I'm sure she has a lot of insight, and yeah. thank God that she survived. Yeah, I told her she did um, a fabulous job on going on, I think, CNN. She, okay. she went on some talk shows. Good. Yeah. And I hope that people take her seriously. Yeah, well, you know, one cause... thing that stood out to me about her conversations in the media is that, you know, I was a former sex worker, and I'm like, she does hair now, and she's like, Get it right, folks. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah, I know. And they yeah. all just want to call her a sex so, yeah, worker. Yeah, like, they do. Again, she's not defined by that. No, I think that would be lovely to have her on to talk about the 
the stigma and uh, about being a sex, a former sex worker. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. I think that she would okay. have a lot of insight. Employees at RH Consultants, which is uh, uh, Rex's architectural firm, said that he loved guns. He loved hunting. He bragged a lot about lying in wait while bear hunting, seemed to enjoy grossing out employees and giving them information that they didn't want to hear about his hunting shenanigans. Well, then if he's a hunter, he probably dismembers animals. Yeah. His experience. Mm -hmm. See, I know. And then the defense is probably going to be like that arm saw was so that he could do whatever with his animals. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up. Um, They, you know, other people described him as creepy at work. And, you know, I suspect Rex's estranged wife, Asa, probably has a very different memory of him fond memories. Like, you know, everybody's describing all the bad things now that he's been arrested. Like, oh yeah, he was creepy and he was this, and maybe he was all those things. But to his estranged wife, Asa, I would imagine she has a lot of different, uh, she has different memories. It was, um, I was able to meet with her, but, um, I want to go back to the hair for a second. Yeah. Because, let's talk about it. Um, as a female, my hair, I shed so much hair. Of course. Everywhere, yeah. all the time. Yeah. So, and also has longish hair, but anywho, um, you know, just because her hair is found doesn't mean she is a part of this in any way. First of all, they've already ruled that she has an alibi. She was out of town. I just want to make the record straight that even though they found I appreciate that. Yeah. transfer DNA, which is the hair's. It doesn't mean that she was involved. Plus, I mean, she was driving when uh, she drove the avalanche. She actually didn't have a car. So I will share this. Um, The day that Rex was arrested, the same time, the feds went to her house and told her, we have a warrant and we're going to search this and you need to leave. And they seized the car, but they helped her go get a rental car. And then Asa went to her father lives nearby. He's elderly and very sick. And the press quickly found where she was at and it was causing problems with her father's health. Mm -hmm. And so she issued a statement like, please press, leave me alone. You're hurting my family, my elderly, elderly family, extended family members. So Asa left her father's house with her two adult children, Victoria and Christopher, and slept in the rental car for this period of time. Also, I want to share that when the feds seized the home and the and the avalanche, they um they told her to pack an overnight bag. And also didn't know how long she was going to be away from the house. She thought it was going to be just a moment. Um and so she left her animals in the house. They trapped her animals and put them in a kill shelter. She was just recently again able to like get trigger what I just the animal lovers out there and me. That's just so heartbreaking on both ends, both for Asa and her family and the animals. These are innocent bystanders. The the adult children are living normal lives. And then one day they, the feds knock on the door and say, everything you know about your life is a lie. I just want people to keep that in mind. Imagine you get a knock on the door and it's the feds saying your husband, your partner is a suspected serial killer. And we're going to seize your house immediately right now, pack an overnight bag. You, Your mind is racing. You don't know up or down. It's so bewildering and so blindsiding. So then what happens is um, this search of the house is not 24 hours, 48 hours. It's days. Mm-hmm. And I... Th- I'll look it up. I don't know exactly, but I want to say it was 12 to 14 days. I mean, there was an exorbitant amount of things in the home that they had to go through. Asa came back to her with her adult children to find um, all of the mattresses are gone. That She has nothing to sleep on. Her daughter sleeps on a bean bag. Her son sleeps near on the dog bed um, in, in his room. The doors are all missing. The doors are custom height, by the way, for Rex human because he's so tall he had it custom made um the bathtub has huge chunks sawed out the kitchen countertop is um there's a butcher block countertop and that's cut out like someone just went in your imagine someone just went in your kitchen and sawed a big square out of it yeah 
I can't even imagine. I mean, and, these, these, I mean, I want to make this clear. They're doing their job. Yeah. The feds were doing their job. They're seizing evidence. Okay. I got that. But, um, I want to put respect to, to the family. Your, your home is, is now potentially a crime scene or they're suspecting has evidence in it. So that's another, you know, mind mm-hmm. F, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and so when I was in her home, I, I, I asked to use the restroom and it's the only restroom in the house. And they had a little sheet that was with a, a screw, you know, like to put it up. The and door was privacy. gone. Yeah. They, they couldn't take, the pipes are gone. The P-traps are gone. Well, they, of course they took it because they're like looking for evidence DNA, everywhere. Maybe, DNA or, evidence. Yeah. yeah. Um, I went in the basement. I saw the vault that everybody's talking about. And it's not a soundproof room. It's a very large room, but it's, I say it's not soundproof because if you soundproof something, you put, um, a sound barrier at the ceiling and it it was just open, um, beams. Yeah. Like the walls, I think you just got like, don't go all the way up. Yeah. There's a gap. Yeah. And there's wood paneling inside. Yeah. It's not soundproof. It's. Yeah. I know I had read somewhere that an interior decorator or designer had gone in the house and he had forbid her to go into this vaulted room. Well, the vaulted room carried all the guns. And it was like a bank door, a big, huge bank vault door. And um, one could easily surmise that it was gun safety for the guns. There was no mattress in there. Well, obviously everything was taken. So I'm not going to speculate that any type of sex torture happened in that room because you could easily debunk that with a non sinister type of <laughs> yeah and the thought, room wasn't yeah. soundproof so if that happened it would have had to have happened when he's in the house alone but like we and just don't no have room. any evidence also, like we don't we're also, not going to speculate on and sensationalize. Right. That's what hurts families too, is yeah. when, when innocent things are made to be mistaken for creepier things. Like that's what makes it for the family to believe too that um these these allegations are true when there's a lot of you know untruth out there. Right. Uh that they're hearing in the media and then they're wondering, is this true? Is it not? But a lot of it's not really even been substantiated yet. And um I have to ask you, like, are there you talk about the media and you talk about like everybody has all these questions. I already know what my immediate questions are, but like <laughs> are there questions that are problematic that you that the media and people ask the victims that really should just not be asked. Yeah, we should not say how did she not know or she should have she she knew. To make that accusation is really damning because if, if you look and, and the reason why the question I have a problem with the question is that we need to stay focused on the alleged killer Rex mm-hmm. Hurman and we need to look at what makes a person live a double life like what makes someone operate you have to just put natural human behavior into play here and then you'll easily answer this yourself yeah if you you could answer this yourself adult children if they saw blood if they saw anything traumatizing like that they would questions. they would ask questions and they yeah. would share and speak to people about yes. it yes um the the wife she has nothing to gain with women being murdered. Um, it's in the context of history with violent offenders, they've all lived double lives. And if you've ever been cheated on, you would know what that's like. They hide it so they don't it have to answer for all it. All the time. And like if you were cheated on and me as your friend and I'm like, well, how the hell do you not know? I mean, come on. it be, You don't know because they don't want I you to know. It. My husband went to work. He said he went to work. He went to he work. He went to work. So it was so awesome. It's the same thing. She, unless you have any cause to question, but it's from what I've observed, I think if, you know, I think Rex led, led a double life, um, whether he was a serial killer that is to be proven in court. You know, I'm he's alleged serial killer, but he did he live a double life with sleeping with prostitutes? 
He did. He had a he had a Tinder profile with the name Andy, not even his real name. He had a another email account. He had burner phones. He was not if if people just heard the evidence, which it's been reported in the media, all this evidence, then why are we asking that question? It, it it makes sense that they wouldn't know. He he wants to continue doing what he's doing because he gets some sort of satisfaction from it. And the only way he can keep doing what he's doing is if he keeps it from everybody, including his family. So it is and bullshit I'm, to just assume, because I think you said earlier when you and I were talking this morning, you said to ask me, like your father was arrested for serious crimes. For somebody to ask you, how could you not know? That's them assuming that you were complicit yeah. in his crime. It's accusing me. Which is of absurd. Being a part of it. It's yeah. absurd. So it's I very appreciate damning. you saying yeah. that. And I think it needs to be said. And I think you probably speak for many uh, family members of killers and perpetrators of other serial, uh, serious crimes. Yeah, they would all agree with me because, I mean, we're innocent bystanders. We're actually crime victims. You know, yeah. Oh, you're absolutely, you're absolutely victims. But I wanted to say, I ended up deciding to do a GoFundMe when a a Daily Mail reporter uh, named Ruth asked Asa, "Would a GoFundMe be helpful?" And she said yes. So that to me was the consent because I said earlier I needed the blessing of Asa. So then I created the GoFundMe. I've never created one before, and I want to say I was really happily surprised that people saw her as a crime victim and saw her innocence. She had an alibi and they started contributing funds and the money. Um, and what I said in the GoFundMe and is true is that first also didn't have a bank account. Um, and so this was, she started a bank account so she could receive these emergency funds for her. The funds are going to provide a rental car because the avalanche is not coming back, uh, for a very long time, if ever, Mm -hmm. uh, she needs temporary housing if she wants to get out of the house while they repair it. Um, I have heard from uh, a criminologist that I've worked with that sometimes homeowners insurance will pay for the repairs right. of of an investigation like that yeah. if it's damaged. Hopefully. But yeah, hopefully. Um, and also it, it's going to provide food. And if she wants to get away... It gives her the money to get away. And she's trying to get a divorce. Yes. As well. Well, and I want to say that none of the money is going towards her divorce lawyer or any of the any of the legal fees to divorce Rex. Mm-hmm. But she did she did file for a divorce immediately. And I think that's what helped people understand that um she's understanding the charges. Yeah, it, that speaks volume. Yeah, it says a lot. So I appreciate you sharing your insight. And I know that you actually have a lot more insight on Asa and her family and their family home. But out of respect for Asa and her family, she needs to be allowed the opportunity to tell her own story in her own words. So there are certain things that you're not going to say as you shouldn't. Right. But I do want to say that um, the GoFundMe is live. And if you'd like to share the money you would spend on a Starbucks coffee today and deposit some money. It is being, you know, it is helping her for necessary basic needs. She is not wealthy. She has, she up until the point of the GoFundMe going into her bank account, she had no access to money in any way. The gifts from strangers of gift cards were able to give her food. Um, So just, you know, know that. And also, when it comes to the families of the other victims, they, I am hoping for justice and I'm, I'm also supporting them in telling their stories here. Um, and give with you more background. Um, yeah. But I don't think, like you said, we're going to learn everything about Rex Huberman. But um, I, I think that you and I are not done talking about this case. Obviously, your, like, wow, we've really like, yeah, gone this long. Went a long time. This is a very complex and longstanding case. But I echo your sentiments. And I absolutely, for all victims, being the women who lost their lives and the man and the baby, um, I want justice for them and their families, and they absolutely deserve it. It does not matter what you do for a living. It does not matter. It doesn't matter. You're human. And I want Asa and her children to have some peace, to feel safe and secure, and and be able to 
move forward. I don't know if you ever move on, but you move forward Mm -hmm. from this. And I think that what you're doing is amazing. And I think that the fact that the GoFundMe has raised, I believe, over fifty thousand dollars the last time I looked at it. Yeah, I haven't Don't looked quote at me on it. that. But other people feel the same way. So um, also, I want to share that I do share all the positive comments. That's what I love is when people make a donation. People have been making a comment of support, and they are being shared with Asa and the family, right. and that is incredible. I imagine I mean, that's even just a little or maybe a large um, comfort. Yeah, it's going to help her heal faster to sure. know that she is embraced. And, um, you know, she is right now, in my opinion, a living victim. And sadly, the other victims are not alive. And so all we can provide is justice for the deceased murdered victims And hence why I created the GoFundMe for the living victims Mm -hmm. that need resources now to keep going. And um, it also, when when something like this happens, and I want to be transparent, when something like this happens, a high-profile case, when you're destitute and you need money, a lot of times people have to sell their story. So this affords her to not have to sell her story. That's a really good point. Because that precious puts pressure on her to um, speak before she's ready. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and like a lot of news agencies obviously don't pay for stories, but there's going that there are some outlets that will pay. And so let's just say we're both excited to uh, talk to Dr. Michelle Ward. She is a criminal psychologist with a lot of experience in this very topic that we're talking about. She will be part two of this or part three. I don't know how many parts. And you and I, I think we'll come back on at some point when you, when you're able to share more without being disrespectful to yeah, they've, you know, the family, they've got to share first, but I appreciate you being here with me as always. And this was very insightful, heartbreaking. Um, but I think more on it later. Yeah. We, there's so much more to share. I have a, a lot more to share that I, I can share. And then um, also I'm looking forward to Dr. Michelle Ward because we have five questions for her. Would you rathers that we, yeah. on the way here to the studio, Jamie and I had a good chuckle coming up with, <laughs> what are the questions we want to do as an icebreaker for Dr. Uh, Dr. Michelle, Dr. Michelle Ward, this Ward. badass, beautiful PhD having. Barbie like, doll. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we've got a few uh, would you rather questions because we feel like we want to break the ice. This was a very dark I was. We need some levity. We, we need, need some a little levity. bit of levity, but we are going to get her insight on this case and other on cases how like it, not so. to raise a serial killer. That's right. Ooh, <laughs> we just plugged uh, Dr. Michelle Ward's podcast. Yay. All right, you guys, we'll see you back soon. We're not done talking about this case, but um, thanks for joining us. And Melissa, thank you. Thanks. Hey, lie detectors, leave a five-star rating and drop your favorite lipstick in the review section because we lie detectors don't gatekeep. And follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Lipstick and Lies if you want to see behind the scenes and clips of us recording each episode and be a part of the lie detector community. Executive producers of Lipstick and Lies are Melissa Moore, myself, Jamie Rice, and Sim Sarna. The podcast is co-produced by Cloud10 Media. Subscribe to Lipstick and Lies so you don't miss an episode. We all know that crime is usually a good old boys club, but sometimes the truth lies behind lipstick.